بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على نبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I think in every masjid سبحان الله having microphone issues <laughs> I'm hearing it <laughs> see I think uh, just a second. I think that did the trick, alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, it's Friday, so we'll try to finish uh, about 10 minutes early, hopefully, insha'Allah. Give us some time to make dua. It's a Friday, it's Ramadan, we're fasting, alhamdulillah. Uh, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in our time throughout our halaqa today. I mean, uh, we're going to be going through Surah Al-Zumar, which is the 39th Surah of the Qur'an. Yes, 39th Surah of the Qur'an. Uh, we'll also be going through Surah Al-Ghafir and Surah Fussilat. Okay, Surah Al-Zumar, Surah Al-Ghafir and uh, Surah Fussilat. Bismillah. In uh, Surah Al-Zumar, in the first four verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms that the deen or Islam is for him and he is deserving of worship. And we see here how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, mentions, indeed we have sent down to you the book, O Muhammad, in truth. So worship Allah. And in the, in the third verse Allah says, أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ That deen, which deen is it? Which religion is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, unquestionably, for Allah is the pure religion. Which religion? Islam. Of course, we know it's Islam. Now, subhanAllah, today I spent some time and I'll, I'll speak about it inshallah. But I was speaking to someone who came to the masjid today uh, in Milton. And he was there from before Jumu'ah. And I left the masjid at around 5... 15 or 5, yeah, around 5.15, 5.20. Just because we were talking about Islam and Christianity, you know, just talking about the deen. And tonight, subhanAllah, as I was going through, you know, putting my notes together, I, I, I realized how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, and we'll see that in our last, last verse that we will take, how important it is to learn our deen in order to speak to others about it. You know, subhanAllah, people will come to us of various different religions and try to uh, prove their points. And I told him straight off the bat, just like I always say, you know, I don't like debating. I don't like to debate between my religion and your religion. You want to learn about Islam? Ask me whatever questions you want about Islam. But I'm not here to say, well, Islam this and Christianity that and go back and forth. And the conversation ended up being that way, subhanAllah. For many hours we went on and on and on. From Jumu'ah, which I led at 1.30, all the way until close to 5.30. We're just sitting there discussing this, subhanAllah. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us here that he affirms Islam is the deen for him according to him. Allah in uh, Allah that Islam is a pure religion and it is the truth. And it's come with clarification to the religions of the past. And we'll see that as we go along, inshaAllah ta'ala. Verses number seven to eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that he dislikes disbelief and when people only call on him in times of difficulty. And one of the types of disbelief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights is that we simply turn to Him only when we need something. We'll see here, we'll read through it, it's fairly lengthy. And I don't want to, like I said, I want to finish a little bit early today, so I don't want to go into too much detail. But in verse number 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, If you disbelieve, indeed Allah is free from need of you. And He, do, sorry, he does not approve for His servants' disbelief. And if you are grateful, he approves it for you. And no bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another. So no one will bear the burden of another person. Then to your Lord is your return. And he will inform you about what you used to do. Indeed, he is knowing of that within 
the chests, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes to tell us, and when adversity touches man, when someone goes through hardship, when a person is facing difficulty in life, he calls upon his Lord, turning to him alone. We turn to Allah and we make dua. You're going through a hardship, you're going through difficulty, you turn to Allah. Of course, that's normal. We do that all the time. But we need to remember to call upon Allah at times when we're not suffering as well, not going through difficulties. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting here. He then goes on to say, then when he bestows on him a favor from himself, when Allah makes that situation go easy for you, or he, he clarifies, he rectifies that problem, the difficulty you're going through in life, Allah says, he forgets him. He forgets him whom he called upon before. We forget Allah. As soon as things go our way, the way that we want it to be, you know, you might have had a car accident, and then you make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, please rectify this issue. And the insurance company says, you know what, it's a total write-off, we're going to give you this amount of money. And you're like, whoa, I never thought I would get this much money. And then you go to buy a car, and you get a, a better car than the car you used to have. And then at that point in time, you were, you were struggling, you were making dua to Allah, you're like, Ya Allah, please make it easy for me. I need a car, I need to go to work. I don't know if I'm going to get the money that I need for my car and so on and so forth. Then you get something that was better than what you had. Do we remember a lot at that point in time? A few of us do, some of us do, right? We remember a lot, we're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're thankful that we got what we asked for, what we needed. But at the same time, we notice that many people forget. Many people get into that car and they're like, Alhamdulillah. Good. And that's it. They'll only say Alhamdulillah. Or they'll begin and say Bismillah. Or they'll start Subhanallah. Say the dua when they're getting into a car and driving off. And that's it. They're not thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they've received. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us here. When a person calls upon him and he grants them that during the time of difficulty, then he forgets Allah who he called upon. And he attributes to Allah equals to mislead people from his way. So he attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala others. You know what? If you have a car accident, don't worry. Call up this travel, uh, call up this insurance broker. Don't worry. Go with this insurance company. Last time I had an accident, this was, you know, they gave me this amount of money. It was supposed to only be 2,000. They gave me 6,000, whatever it is, right? So we call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek assistance from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. There's nothing wrong with seeking help, seeking assistance. But first we turn to Allah. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that we, we don't do that. We do the opposite. We only turn to Him when we are in that difficult moment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, at the end of verse number 8, Say, enjoy your disbelief for a little. Indeed, you are of the companions of the fire. Subhanallah. So we need to understand that when we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should be at times of difficulty as well as at times of ease. Even when we don't need Him. You're sitting down, you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. That is sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is beloved or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we do that. And that's remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need anything. You don't, you're not sitting there making dua, Ya Allah, I don't need anything right now, but I felt like just calling upon you. Make dhikr, do adhkar, do istighfar, ask for forgiveness. All of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. That, you know, that includes what we're discussing. That also includes remembering Allah and calling upon Him at times when you don't need Him. You're calling upon Allah, asking for forgiveness. You're sitting there, are you committing a sin right now? Probably not, you're sitting in the masjid. You're, you're listening, you're not doing anything, you're just sitting, breathing and listening. But you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. It's not a time of need, it's not a time of hardship, but you're asking Him for something, forgiveness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see us doing that regularly. We move on to verses number 36 to 40 of Surah Al-Zumar. Verse number 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us how He is sufficient for the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for the believers and we know that. We know that when, you know, like we were just discussing, we're going through a hardship in life, Allah is sufficient. Even if I don't get the money that I'm deserving for my car, for example, in that accident, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient. Some way, somehow, somewhere down the line, Allah will make something good happen to me. There will be some khair in it. Whether now, later, in the hereafter, there's something good in it. Allah knows best, right? But the mushrikun admit that Allah is their creator as well. So us as believers, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in verse number 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights for us that the mushrikun, they also admit that Allah is their creator. Let's read it. وَلَئِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ قُلْ أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ أَرَادَنِي إِنْ أَرَادَنِيَ اللَّهُ بِضُرٍ هَلْ هُنَّ كَاشِفَاتُ الضُّرٍ هل هن كاشفات ضره أو أرادني برحمة هل هن ممسكات رحمتي قل حسبي الله عليه يتوكل المتوكلون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us at the beginning of verse number 38, And if you ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? Who's the one that created? Who's the creator? Who's the supreme creator? They will say, Allah. They will admit that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows us that, and this is one of the reasons why we, we are allowed to eat from Ahlul Kitab. Right? We're allowed to eat from Ahlul Kitab. Why? Because they believe in a supreme Lord, a supreme God. Now, I don't want to get into the details of, of the food that I just mentioned, like we're allowed to eat from Ahlul Kitab, etc., because then people will open up doors of lots and lots of conversation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes the Abrahamic faiths. Judaism, Christianity. And we see as well that here Allah indicates to us even those who were the mushrikun, who were worshipping idols at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, even from amongst the idol worshippers, there are some who also believe in a supreme God. Take Hinduism for example. In Hinduism, they have lots of gods, little gods. They actually have little, little statues too, right? Lots of little gods, subhanAllah. And they worship these gods. Or they ask for forgiveness, they ask for food, they ask for provisions, they ask for intercession. Ask God, the Supreme God. So they believe in a, a larger God or a bigger God. And this is an example for us subhanAllah that sometimes we can easily clarify things. Easily clarify things with those who disbelieve by having them understand that you also believe in a Supreme God. And because you believe in a supreme God, you don't need to believe in these smaller gods. You don't need that. Why do you need a smaller God, a lesser God, an, an idol or a statue made out of stone or wood? Why do you need that? You don't need that. You believe that this small little thing is going to go or intercede on your behalf to a larger God. Why don't you just call upon that large God yourself? That supreme God. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that they recognize Allah as the creator. As the creator. And so we differentiate now. We know in, in when we talk about tawheed, we break it down into different groups, right? Generally speaking, the more common groups or more common types of tawheed is tawheed al-rububiyyah, which is affirming that Allah is our creator and Lord. Tawheed uh, al-uluhiyyah, which is uh, understanding that He is deserving of our worship, Right? Tawheed al-ibadah and Tawheed al-asma' wa-sifat. Understanding and believing in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the mushrikun as well as those that, that don't believe in what we believe in, they believe in a God as their creator. I'm not talking about the atheist. I'm talking about those who have a little bit of religion in them, right? They believe that God is their creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that here. لَيَقُولُنَّ Allah. If you ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? Who created you? Where did this come from? Your heart is beating. How is it beating? Did you tell it to beat? Did you tell the blood to go through your body? Did you tell your nails to grow so that every Friday you can clip them? Did you do that? No, you didn't. Who's making that happen? Well, God, He's our creator. And so we see that there are those who disbelieve 
And when we say disbelieve, they disbelieve because of what they believe in. They disbelieve because of what they believe in. They disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only sole God to be worshipped. And that is the true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We move on to verses number 68 and 70. And we see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout these surah, He talks a lot about belief. Goes into a lot of verses to do with belief, 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 belief. And in verse number 68 to 70, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the blowing of the trumpet. Let me just get it. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And the horn will be blown, and whoever is in the heavens, and whoever is on the earth will fall dead, except whom Allah wills. Every single one of the creation will be terminated, or will end, except those or that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits to remain. Why do we say that? First of all, Jannah is part of the creation of Allah. Jahannam is part of the creation of Allah. Is it going to end? No, it's not. Those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed as doing certain tasks from amongst the angels, for example, those will carry out their tasks, all the rest done. They will end, they will cease to exist uh, for that point in time. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us again, then it will be blown once again. And at once they will be standing looking on. So we will die and we will be resurrected. And we mentioned this yesterday or the day before when we're placed in the earth. And it's the soil, it's, it's dead, it's nothing, right? Nothing comes from it except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to grow out of the ground. And we will, be, we will be placed into the ground and then we will come from the ground as well. And so when the trumpet is blown, everything will end. And when the trumpet is blown, everything will come back. And this is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In verse number 69, He shows us, And the earth will shine with the light of its Lord, and the record of deeds will be placed, and the prophets and the witnesses will be brought, and it will be judged between them in truth, and they will not be wronged. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use justice on that day. In verse number 70, And every soul will be fully compensated for what it did, and he is most knowing of what they do. And this is important for us to understand. Every soul will give account for what we did, our actions, our deeds, etc. And this is one of the things that I was discussing with that, um, with that man today when I was speaking to him about Islam and Christianity. And he was like, well, wait a second, you guys need to do things in order to get to paradise. In order to get to heaven, you have to do things. You believe in Allah, yes, you believe in the Prophet, the messengers, etc. You believe in the books, you believe in the Day of Judgment, you believe in, 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 in the things that we have to believe in, in our deen. But he says you need to do things in order to get to heaven. We don't. Like, that's, so he was saying us as Muslims, we do. And they as Christians don't. They automatically get heaven. And because they're given heaven, they live good lives. I was like, so you have to do something. He's like, no, we don't have to do anything. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have to do anything? And that was something that we spoke about for hours, literally for hours. Do you have to do something in order to get paradise? And he was saying, no, as Christians, they don't. And I was saying, yes, as Muslims, we do. And so do you. As, as Christians, you need to do that as well. And he's like, no, it doesn't make sense because we're already given paradise. So technically, I don't need to do anything. And I was like, okay, so if you murder someone now, is that considered a sin? In Christianity, yes. And he said, yes, it's considered a sin. So now that you murdered someone, does that mean that you will no longer go to paradise? Well, you rejected God, so no, you're not going to go to paradise. Or maybe you repent from it. Okay, so because of your action, you're refused or you're forbidden from going into paradise. No, it's not because of the actions. You don't understand it. I'm like, ah, oh, I understand it. One of us doesn't understand it. I understand it clearly, subhanAllah. And this is where, you know, sometimes Allah has to, we need to make dua to Allah. We need to make dua to Allah to give us wisdom in our speech. Sometimes things are really easy for us to understand. And others will not understand it. And sometimes He gives us wisdom to speak and we say things so clearly, easy to understand. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, he closes their hearts. He seals their hearts from understanding because they don't want to understand. And I truly believe in that subhanAllah. When I speak to people sometimes, you can see, you can sense, you can feel they don't want to understand. They don't want to. 
They do not want to accept the truth. And because they don't want to, their hearts are sealed. And you wonder like, you're an intelligent individual, why are you not understanding? This makes total sense. It makes complete sense. You could tell it to a child, they're going to understand. Nope. They will not accept it because they don't want to. And because they don't want to, Allah seals their hearts. They no longer can. And so subhanAllah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us wisdom in our speech and our actions so we can convey the message of the deen to those uh, who live around us. Ameen. We move on to verse number 71. In verse number 71 of Surah Az-Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the disbeliever led to hell, uh, sorry, the disbeliever will be led to hell and the believers will be led to paradise. And those that enter paradise, they will be given glad tidings. They will be greeted with salam, peace, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبْتُمْ فَدْخُلُوهَا خَالِدِينَ The keepers of paradise will say to those who are entering paradise, there will be a group led to Jahannam and a group led to paradise, to Jannah, to, he to heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that the gatekeepers, those that watch the gates, they will greet the people of paradise. سَلَامٌ uh, عَلَيْكُمْ They will greet them with peace. You have become pure, so enter it to abide eternally therein, to live therein forever. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that throughout our actions and our deeds, we do get them weighed and we do go through a judgment and we will be questioned. And then we will either be led towards Jan Jahannam as we discussed yesterday or Jannah as we're discussing today. We move on to the next surah. Surah number 40 which is Surah Ghafir. What is Ghafir? Please forgive me, today I'm really, really, you know, thirsty, subhanAllah. My, I'm not really thirsty, but my mouth is very dry. So it's a little bit difficult. Surah Ghafir as well as Surah Mu'minun, right? Or Mu'mineen. So as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala titles, or this Surah has been titled Ghafir. What is Ghafir? Man huwa? Allah, right? That's exactly it, mashallah. Every day he's got the answer and the, the definition to the answer, mashallah. The one who forgives, the forgiver. Who is the forgiver? Allah, right? So that's what he said in Arabic, like, who is ghafir? Who's the forgiver? He's the one who, forgive, who forgives the sins. Who is that? Allah, right? Allah is the one who forgives the sins. Now this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us here in the first three verses, Hamim Tanzeen al Kitab min Allah al Aziz al Alim Ghafir al Dhanb Qabil al Tawb Shadid al Iqab al Tawl La ilaha illa hu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us hamim. Again, huruf muqatta'at. Disjointed letters. The meaning we leave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ghafir al-dhamb. Wa qabil al-tawb. Uh, I skipped to verse number three, but that's fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in verse number three. Wa qabil al-tawb. The forgiver of sin. Acceptor of repentance. Who is that? Allah, right? He forgives our sins. And this is the month of Ramadan. This is the month, especially now we're entering into the last 10 nights. When does it, when does it begin? Tomorrow. Tomorrow is which night? 21st night. Tonight is the 20th night. A lot of people get confused. I actually got a message from Vancouver asking me, can you ask the mashayikh, ask the shaykh, when does the last 10 nights begin? And I said, it's very simple. It's not, you know, rocket science. You count one, two, three, four, all the way to 10. Okay, 10 days, the night began, and then the 10th, the 10th day. And then on the 10th day, what happens at night? That's the 11th night. So you begin 11, 12, 13, 14, you count another 10. On the 20th night, that is your end of the 10th, the second 10th. On the 21st night, which is tomorrow, that's the beginning. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay, not rocket science. Very easy, subhanAllah. Okay, so the 21st night begins tomorrow. That's the beginning of the last 10 days 
and last 10 nights, because we begin with the night first, last 10 nights and last 10 days of the month of Ramadan. What did the Prophet ﷺ encourage us to say? What type of, 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 of forgiveness did he, did he say frequently during the last 10 nights? Allahumma innaka, what did you say? Surah Ghafir, mashallah. Interesting, very good, very good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us. Ghafir al-dham wa qabil al-tawb. Yes, He is the one who forgives the sins and the one who accepts our repentance. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us through the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Aisha radiallahu anha teaches us that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to constantly say, Allahumma innaka afuun. تُحِبُّ الْعَفْوَ فَعْفُ عَنِّي Or فَعْفُ عَنَّا All of us, right? So it's, a, it's something that the Prophet ﷺ used to say regularly. He used to seek forgiveness a lot more during the last 10 nights than the previous 10 and the previous 10 before that. And so it's an important time for us to now constantly seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the surah of forgiveness. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses it. And it's the time of the year, it's the month, Ramadan, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes the doors, the gates to Jahannam, and opens the doors to paradise, and chains down shaitan. And this is the time when, because we're fasting, we create a barrier, a shield protecting us. Junna, it's a shield, it's, it's something that protects us from all evils, including that of Jahannam, as the, as the scholars you know, explain. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it's a shield from Jahannam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in the first three verses that Allah is the one who accepts our repentance and forgives our sins. شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ ذِي الطَّوْلِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ Severe in punishment, owner of abundance. There is no deity, no true God deserving of worship except Him. To Him is the, uh, the, the destination, the final destination. So we will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In verse number 14, command to worship Allah even if it's hard for us, even if the circumstances that we are in are difficult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us here, فَادْعُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ So invoke Allah, ud'u Allah, مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Being sincere to Him in religion. Now dua is of various different types. Here Allah says invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But He's showing us, although the disbelievers dislike it, they don't like that you do it, continue to do it. And you might be praying your salah in public, and we've discussed this earlier, and you feel shy to do it. You feel shy to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And salah is dua. When we translate it, or when we define it, I should say, what is salah? Salah is dua. You are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your prayer. Right? From the beginning until the end, it's dua. You begin, dua istiftah. Surah Al-Fatiha, it is a dua in itself, right? Then you recite of the Qur'an, you go into ruku', you're praising Allah, you go into sujood, you're praising Allah, but it's also a time when you can ask for, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bikin, sorry, between your two sajda, it's a time to ask for forgiveness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to ask for forgiveness between the two sajdas. A lot of us come up and go right back down. It's a time to pause, to relax, and to ask for forgiveness. Right? That's important for us to learn because many of us don't, we don't do that. Right? We haven't been taught to do that. In sajda, but I'm talking about when you come up from, from sajda in the jalsa, when you're sitting between two sajda, bayna sajdatain, it's, it's, it's a time of asking for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, yeah. So dua is ibadah, we know that. In the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ad-dua huwa al-ibadah, right? And so it's important for us to constantly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at times when we need to fulfill the actions, you need to pray, you're fasting. People say, why do you fast? They criticize why you fast. It's such long days, it's really hot, and subhanAllah, tomorrow is going to be hotter, and you know the day after is going to probably even hotter than today. How are you going to fast? It's difficult. Why do you do that? Don't punish yourself. Don't make it difficult for yourselves. Why are you making it hard for your, for your teenage children? No, don't worry. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us long days. And those that don't fast, they know that it's difficult. But those that do fast know that Allah puts barakah in our time. He puts barakah in our food. Outside of Ramadan, we chug day and night. But subhanAllah, during Ramadan, you might eat one meal and it's sufficient for you for the whole day, for 18 hours or for 24 hours until the next meal that you eat. That's enough. All you need is a little bit of water at night until suhoor. And when suhoor time is done, khalas, you're okay. You're fine for the whole day. And those that don't believe, they criticize it. Don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us here. Call upon Allah. Do your ibadah. Worship Him. Even if the non-believers dislike what you're doing, don't worry about it. Don't worry, do it. Allah will put barakah in your life, in those actions, in what you're doing, and every other aspect of your life. We move on to verse number 18. Uh, and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates to us a description of fear, which is really interesting because, you know, it, it's something that, that happens to us. How many, okay, youth, let me ask you a question. When you go on a roller coaster, have you ever been on a roller coaster? Yeah? Okay. MashaAllah. When you go on the roller coaster, do you ever get scared? What do you feel when you get scared? How do you feel inside of your chest? Hey? You feel like you're going to fall? You go up and then what happens when you go up and then what happens when you come down? Good. What do you feel? Do you feel anything in your chest, in your throat? Any of the youth want to say anything? How do you feel when you enter a roller coaster? You're going up. Or you're in your car and you're not paying attention and your dad goes up a hill and then comes down the hill. Do you feel like something's in your throat? You ever feel that? Yeah, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that for us here in verse number 18. And warn them, O Muhammad, of the approaching day. Warn the people that there will be a time where we will be resurrected and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When hearts are at the throats, Look at that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the fear. That's the amount of fear that people will have, right? Or that's a type of fear. One of the types of fear, because people will be, you know, fearing their, their questioning and, and doing crazy things, subhanAllah. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, when hearts are at the throats, filled with distress. And that's what we feel when we get scared. It feels like our heart comes right up to our throat, right? It's like, oh, what just happened there? You're going over that roller coaster, ooh, coming down, subhanAllah. And that's, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing that on that day we will be so scared. It's not just that split second where you're going up and then boom, coming down the roller coaster, split second, that feeling in your throat and it's gone. No, no, it's going to last for a long, long time. You're going to be scared. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, warn the disbelievers, warn them that this day will come where they will be questioned and they will have that fear within them. And if they understood the fear now in this life, then they understand, wait a second, that's only something I feel when I'm extremely scared of something. It's like the pinnacle of my fear in this life. And if that's how it's going to be, then maybe I need to look deeper into it. Maybe I need to understand why I'm going to feel that fear. And I don't want to feel it. So I need to change my life in order to live a way where I will not be in that fear. Where I'll be comfortable on that day. I'll be under shade on that day. I will be someone that is protected on that day. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from feeling that feeling and from fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment on that day. I mean. In verse number 19, he knows what deceives the eyes as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us. He knows that which deceives the eyes and what is within us concealed. Now subhanAllah, this is really interesting because sometimes things catch our eye and we see something or we hear of something and we want to do it or we work towards it secretly without anyone knowing what's inside of us. They don't know our intentions. They don't know what we're doing. And sometimes you'll notice that something catches your attention. You see something and you go towards it. You follow it. You seek it. You want it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates to us, He knows what catches our eye and He knows what we conceal within us. Nothing is secret from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It might be secret to other human beings. And that's something that Allah gave us, that we can conceal our thoughts and emotions within us. But it's not secret to Allah. So purify that which we feel inside of us, so that we can turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in purity. Verse number 60, let's skip across inshallah. And for the sisters, if you could open the lights back there. 
sit in nur and not in, in darkness. Right? Verse number 60 of Surah Ghafir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us a powerful, powerful statement. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ We highlight this usually in Jumu'ah. Call upon me, I will respond to you. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us very clearly, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ And He tells us, Your Lord, Your Lord is saying, اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call upon me, I will answer you. Imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally like, you know, humbling himself. I won't say he's begging us, because he's not begging us. Allah doesn't need us to do this. He's humbling himself in front of us, telling us, you need something? Ask me. You're not begging. It's not, there's a difference between begging. Someone says, what do you need? What do you need? Just ask me. Don't worry. Come on. What do you need? Just tell me. Tell me what you need. Allah's not begging from you to, to, to call upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is humbling himself. Someone comes to your house, and they you know, tell you about maybe something they went through, a very sad story. And you tell them humbly, you're humbling yourself, you're saying, you know what, subhanAllah, if you need anything, you know, as they're leaving your house, you tell them, if you need anything, let me know. Let me know if you need anything, inshallah, I'll do my best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is humbling himself and showing us, if you need something, call upon me, whatever it is that you need, just ask. Just ask, and subhanAllah, how many times do we actually ask Allah? And how many times do we ask Allah at times when we don't need? Like, Ya Allah, I don't need a house. I don't need a car. I don't need anything. Alhamdulillah, I have that. You gave that to me. But Allah, guide me towards what is best. Right? Call upon Him. Ask Him for things that, you know, that are just general. Ask Him for goodness for yourselves. Goodness for our children. Goodness for our community. Goodness for the rest of the ummah. Goodness for people that are suffering and struggling in different parts of the world. We ask, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't need anything right now, but there's people that need. Let me ask Allah for them. There's people that need water. There's people that need food. There's people that need homes. There's people that need clothing. There's people that, that need heat. There's people that need a date to break their fast. Ask Allah to make it easy for those people as well. Not just ourselves. Udiruni astajib lakum. We move on. Uh, for those that are just joining us, I said I want to uh, not go into too much detail today so that we can finish a little bit early and have some time for dua because it's Friday. So for those that are here and wondering why we're not going into so much detail, there's a reason. In verse number 61 to 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights His signs, signs of His creation, things that He created, indicating to us His greatness. In verse number um, 62, I want to recite 62 inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That is Allah, your Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is, that is Allah, your Lord, creator of all things. What, what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? In verse number 61, it is Allah who made for you the night that you may rest therein and the day giving sight. You can actually see during the day. Indeed, Allah is full of bounty to the people, but most of the people are not grateful. Most of the people are not grateful. Subhanallah. We were just talking about dua and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times when we don't need. And He indicates, He knows most of us are not grateful. And so we need to be people that are grateful and thankful. How many times do we sit down, we're waiting for iftar, and we see the food in front of us. And instead of, instead of making dua, we're not even making dua, we're just sitting there chilling, talking. And it happens to all of us, every single one of us. And we see the food in front of us. And we're not even grateful for that. How many of us actually thanked Allah before we put that food in our mouth? A simple thing. What's out there right now? I'm seeing, I'm th I think I'm seeing samosas, <laughs> right? I'm seeing water and I'm seeing dates, right? Simple things. Are we thankful to Allah? Have we thanked Allah? Ya Allah, you know, thanks for this date that you gave me. Thanks for the samosa every single day. When even though we're told, you know, it's most are not the greatest things to eat every single day, they're fried, they're not good for your health. Thanks for giving this to me. Shukr. Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least to have something to eat. 
Right? So be thankful to Allah. Who is He? Allahu Rabbukum Khaliku Kulli Shay. Indeed, that is your Lord, Allah, the creator of all things. There is no deity, no God except Him. So how are you deluded? How how is it that we just don't understand? How is it that those that don't believe don't understand? They see everything in front of them all the time. Subhanallah, we just don't understand. In verse number 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الْحَيُّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ فَادْعُوهُ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ he is the ever-living. There is no deity except Him. So call upon Him, being sincere to Him in religion, in your deen, مخلصين له الدين. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Subhanallah. Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank Him for what we have. You know, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions shapes that look good. Imagine how good things look in front of us. Shapes of things. Right, we look at this and it looks nice, alhamdulillah. Right, some people like it, some people don't. Some people like to have a Hyundai, some people like to have a Honda, some people like to have a Mercedes, some people like the shapes and the look of a BMW, some people like you know bricks on their home to be pink, other people like it to be beige, some people like brown, some people like red, some people like you know white, other people like gray. Everyone has their own taste. Allah created various different shapes and colors and different sizes of things. For us to enjoy. You don't like this, you like that. You don't like that, you like this. There's various different things to choose from. And so we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He's given us. He mentions the sky. The sky as a canopy that protects the earth. What protects us? The ozone layer subhanAllah. Imagine, we don't even think of it. Back in the 80s, I remember this was when they first started to mention a lot, at least for me, because I'm, I was a child at the time, right? We started to hear a lot about the ozone layer and how it was being destroyed and how holes are forming in the ozone layer. And then they started to teach it to us in school, right? They started to teach us about the ozone layer and stuff. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the sky and how He put it there protecting us. Protecting us from what? What, is there something that's falling on us right now? Protecting us from the harmfulness of the rays of the sun. The harm of the rays of the sun. It's protecting us. We put on our sunglasses, UV 100% protection, right? We put on lip balm sometimes, right? U, what is it? UP, UHP or something like that, right? What's the, I forgot what it's called now, subhanAllah. What's it called? SPS? I don't see it here. S, SPF, I think, right? 45, whatever, you know, all these different things, sunblock and so on, protecting us. Why? Because we're now destroying what Allah put there for us as protection. The ozone layer, subhanAllah. And many other things, the sky protects us. We have from the sky protection as in rain comes down when it's too hot, it cools us. When I was living in, in Malaysia, the smog or the haze as we call it is so thick, so you know bad subhanAllah for your health. I remember one point in time it reached toxic levels. It reached a, a, a classification or a grading level that they would use. It, it reached close to 400, it was like 380 or 390. Very dangerous for your health, toxic. If you breathe it, you're breathing toxic air. Air! How does air become toxic, subhanAllah? Because of the pollution in the air and the smoke from you know, burning crops, etc. And I, I think I mentioned this here before. In Singapore, they were thinking of seeding the clouds. Seeding the clouds. Putting something in the clouds that makes it form rain and the rain falls to the ground, subhanAllah. And what would that do? that would purify the air. It would clean out. As the droplets fall, it collects all the garbage in the air, all the, the pollutants in the air, and it falls to the ground. And then subhanAllah, they didn't end up doing it because not too long afterwards, it did, it did rain, alhamdulillah. But the rain, they said, do not let the rain fall on you. Use an umbrella, stay indoors, don't come outside. Because the pollutants were so strong, if it falls on your skin, it's dangerous for you. And people were actually getting like very minor burns on their skin because of the pollutants in the air. Subhanallah. The ozone layer is a protection for us. The sky, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built it in His infinite wisdom. Don't we think of this? Don't those who don't believe think of this? Aren't they convinced of their creator when they think of it? How can there not be a creator? And then people say, 
Mother Nature. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide those who say Mother Nature. It is not Mother Nature, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the creator of themselves as well. We move on to the 41st surah of the Qur'an. In verse number 1 to 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, shows us how the Qur'an is explained in detail. Hamim tanzilun minar rahmanir rahim kitabun fussilat ayatuhu qur'anan arabiyan liqawmi ya'lamun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that this Qur'an is a revelation from the uh, entirely merciful, the especially merciful, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Kitabun Fussilat Ayatu, a book whose verses have been detailed. The Quran is detailed for us in Arabic, Quran for a people who know. Now, a lot of people say, How is the Quran detailed? I don't know how to pray salah using the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us if you don't know, ask the people of knowledge. Where are the people of knowledge going to get it from? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Follow Allah and follow His Messenger. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows us how to pray our salah. So the Qur'an is detailed. It's so detailed. You just sometimes need to put this puzzle piece with that puzzle piece and take this one and put it with that one. And then it makes sense. And this is why we have the people of knowledge who we go to and we ask them, I don't understand this. Can you explain it? I don't understand it. Make sense out of this for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it for us to understand, not so that we can become confused. Remember, we took that verse before. Allah did not reveal the verse so that He can create chaos. He revealed the Qur'an so that we can understand and be reminded of Him. And then we move on to verses number 4 and 5, which highlight to us inviting those who disbelieve, but they don't want to try to understand. And I mentioned this just 20 minutes ago, how those who we invite to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't want to understand. They don't even want to try to understand. Like today I was talking to this person, subhanAllah, very interesting, really, really interesting conversation. And I don't know, he might be watching right now. I don't know, because I gave him my card and he might be watching right now. But subhanAllah, what's really interesting is, you try to make them understand, but it's as though they don't want to understand. Oh, I, you know, the, the Qur'an is not a book of God. What do you mean the Qur'an is not a book of God? You want me to believe that the Bible is a book of God? But you don't want to help me to understand the Qur'an by understanding that the Qur'an is a book of God? And it actually came to that point in time in our conversation where I stopped him and I said, listen, we are going to go nowhere in this conversation if we keep going back and forth by, because me as a believer, as someone who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we also have to believe in the books. And I believe in the Bible. As believers, we believe in the Bible. We don't follow it, but we believe in the Bible. And I believe when you quote things from the Bible, that some of it is possibly true. Some of it is changed. We know that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that in the Quran. He sent me a video just before I left home. And the, I watched only one minute of it. And it's some professor or you know uh, someone who's learned in Christianity trying to prove. And his, his proof is, when you're debating with Muslims, you have a very simple way of ending that conversation in a minute. I was like, okay, this is interesting. He says, they believe, part of their belief is to believe in all the past books, which means they have to believe in your book. So tell them, don't believe in this Quran, don't be a Muslim, you don't need to believe in this, believe in the Bible, done. Your conversation is over. You force the Muslim to believe in your book and that's it. Huh? Where did you get that though? Where does it tell us to believe in the past books? Where? The Qur'an. So you're telling me, I have to believe in the Qur'an for you to prove your point, but I should disregard the rest of the Qur'an so that I can only be fooled by your point? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ وَاضِعِ They change the Qur'an. You're telling me to believe in the Qur'an, to prove your point, but you can't believe in the Qur'an for me to prove my point? I'm sorry, it's not gonna work that way. And this is why when I go back to those verses all the time and say, don't debate, 
don't debate unless you know how to debate and you know those verses and you know how to gently, calmly, nicely debate, don't debate. Because you will just go back and forth and nothing will be solved. There will be nothing. There will be no outcome in that unless you know what you're doing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that here in these verses, uh, inviting those who disbelieve, but some of them they will not believe because they don't even want to try to understand. Verses number six to eight, a call to tawheed. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ وَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ الذين لا يؤتون الزكاة وهم بالآخرة هم كافرون إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم أجر غير ممنون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in verses number 6 to 8 a call to Tawheed Say, O Muhammad, I am only a man like you to whom it has been revealed that your God is but one God and even Jesus said this, right? Worship him. Don't worship me. Worship him. Worship Allah. Don't worship me. And so subhanAllah, it's very clear in our book and in their book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us towards the truth. I mean, in verse number 25 to 29, disbelieving friends make sins seem attractive. Those amongst us who have friends that disbelieve or people around us, acquaintances that disbelieve, they make sins seem beautiful. They make it seem as though it's attractive. Now, you're fasting. Someone at work, you're sitting down having a meeting, a business meeting, they order this nice steak. Come on, you're going to give up this steak? Like it is beautiful, it's calling your name. It's even, even the smell of it, it's like spelling your name. Look at the smoke going up. Right? It's sizzling chicken, mashallah, it's going up. It's spelling your name, Bilal, Muhammad, Abdullah, right? It's spelling your name. They're trying to get you, you know, attracted to this. No, don't eat it, don't consume it, don't touch it. They're telling you, take this, look at this, you know, this is going to make you feel good. Smoke it, drink it, you're going to lose all your worries. Don't smoke it, don't drink it. Why? Because those worries there, they remind you of who you are. They remind you of what you need. You need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might smoke that, you might drink that, and an hour or two later, you feel worse than you did before you touched it. And then what happens? When you recover from how bad you feel, your problems and worries are still there. In fact, they probably came back even worse. Because we know that those that consume alcohol and do things, sinful things, subhanAllah, it only complicates and makes their life more problematic. And then we move on insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, just to add a point there, disbelieving friends make the sins, but one of the sins as well could be the sin of disbelief. So they make disbelief look good. You know what? Just come. Come and follow us. Thy kingdom come, right? Follow us and everything will be fine. Paradise is already yours. You don't need to work for it. You don't need to do anything for it. You will get paradise. Live your life freely as you want and you will be given paradise. No. Don't let others deceive you from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us. In the last three verses that we will take insha'Allah ta'ala, which is verses number 30, uh, 31, 32, and 33, last four verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those, indeed those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then they remained on a right course. Istaqamu. They, re they remained upon that path that goes and leads to Jannah. And remember, this is one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ says, made his hair turn gray. Right? Some of his hair turned gray when, he's, when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum saw him with a few gray hairs. What is it? And he said, Hud wa akhawatuha. What was it in Surah Hud? Istiqama. Istiqama. Sirat al ladina an'an ihdina sirat al mustaqim. It's, it's that steadfastness remaining upon the truth that made the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turn gray. So we see here, Allah says, Indeed, those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on the right course, what happens to them? 
تتنزل عليهم الملائكة. The angels come down and descend upon them, and they say, "ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون." The angels say to them, "Do not fear and do not grieve." But receive good tidings of paradise, glad tidings. You're going to paradise, which you were promised. You were already promised it. We are all promised it. And I said this earlier today to that person as well. Every single one of us is born upon the fitra. We are all born going to paradise, but we change our own selves because we get to choose. You decide your own fate. You get to make the decisions in your life, and you either choose to remain obedient to Allah or to sidetrack and leave from that. نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون. We were your allies in the worldly life and in the hereafter. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala goes on to to explain this to us. And you will have therein whatever your souls desire in Jannah, in Paradise. You'll have whatever you want. And Subhanallah, we see people sitting in front of their food. Those that are sitting in front of the food, please sit closely so you make space for us as well. Eh? Make some space for us, Mashallah. We need to come and sit with you too. You'll have whatever you desire. You'll have everything that you want in Jannah, everything in Paradise, whatever you wish for, and the things that you wish for in this life, like you might want a beautiful Lamborghini. You're not even going to wish for that Lamborghini there. You're going to see things that your eyes can't, you know, you can't even imagine, and you're probably not even going to think of this dunya. You'd be like, that world, forget that world. Look where li- where we live now, Subhanallah. And so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will give us whatever we wish, whatever we desire. Um, and then he goes on, Nuzulam min ghafoorir raheem. As accommodation from a Lord who is forgiving and merciful. Nuzulam, this is something that you get from who? From your Lord, who gave to you because you worked for it, you earned it. And in the last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the best type of speech. What is the best type of speech? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, and who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah? That's the best type of speech. And subhanAllah, it's not easy. It's difficult. I know I just spent the past four some odd hours t- talking to someone about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not easy. You need to be someone that thinks regularly, constantly. You're on your toes, you're thinking. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us those that invite to Allah. You might not be debating, you might not be having an in-depth conversation, but you simply explain why is it that you can sin- that you continue. For example, someone might ask a simple question because it came up the other day. Why is it that you continue to name your child Abdullah? As Muslims, why do we continue to give our children the name Abdullah? If we know that anyone who has the name Abdullah in the airport, right away they get pulled over. Why do you continue to give that name to your children? People ask these questions. You tell them, Abdullah, do you know what it means? You're the servant of Allah. Who cares if you get pulled over? You get pulled over and they ask you, what's your name? My name is the servant of Allah. It's a means of da'wah. You're now giving da'wah to the security agents in the airport. You're telling them something about Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you something, the ability to speech and to convey that message. Cherish it, enjoy it, and call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the best thing that we can do or the best type of speech. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, and who is better in speech than the one who invites to Allah and does righteousness and, and says, indeed, I am of the Muslims. I'm from the Muslims. And so subhanAllah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to keep us upon this deen and to continue to have us as Muslims who worship Him and who submit to Him. Azza wa Jal.
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us forgiveness throughout this month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for all those that are suffering and struggling in different parts of the world to have ease and comfort. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all those who are misguided. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah and blessings in our speech so that we convey the message to others. They receive it, they understand it, and they accept it if it's the truth. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our families from those that are trying to distract them and turn them away from Islam and from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. تعالى امين يا رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم our brothers and sisters you can go over there and sit in front of the food but remember make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is friday it's the last moment on friday and you're fasting and it's a time where you're you know you have multiple guarantees that your dua is accepted during this time so seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember your brothers and sisters in your dua amen jazakumullahu khairan